But let me welcome you here to CSIS. I'm Mark Kansian. I am the um, interim director of the project on military and diplomatic history. We are conducting this event today uh, jointly with the Army Center for Military History, and we are very pleased to welcome them here to CSIS. CSIS's project on military and diplomatic history uh, endeavors to bring uh, historians uh, into uh, the, uh, to the policy community and to give their craft more visibility than uh, maybe it gets otherwise. Uh, um, the academy may, uh, uh, not paying as much attention to those types, sorts of history as maybe they did in the, in the past. I want to make one simple uh, announcement before we get going, a simple administrative announcement. That is in the case, the unlikely event of an emergency. I'll give you instructions about what we'll do. We'll either stay here or go out the front door or the back door. So now on, on to our panel. I just want to inter uh, introduce our moderator, um, uh, Dr. Uh, James Wilbanks. Dr. Wilbanks is a Vietnam veteran, a uh, career Army officer. Uh, he teaches at the Army uh, um, Command and General Staff Officer off, uh, School, where he is the Marshall uh, Professor of Military History. He got his doctorate from University of Kansas. Uh, and we're very pleased to welcome him here and to have us moderate this panel. Oh, over to you, Dr. Wood. Pretty sure they put me on the end of the table there to see if I'd fall off and maybe add some levity here to, the, to a topic that desperately needs some. Uh, thanks, Mark. It's my privilege today to act as a moderator of this discussion of what Professor Howard Jones said in his recent book, A Descent into Darkness. 50, 50 years ago tomorrow, 16 March 1968, as part of Operation Muscatine, elements of Company C, 1st Battalion, 20th Infantry, 11th Infantry Brigade, from the AmeriCal Division were airlifted by the 174th Assault Helicopter Company into a group of hamlets in San Mi Village, San Ten District of Quang Nai Province. Once on the ground, the unit began to sweep the area in search of the 48th NLF Battalion. By the end of the day, despite the fact that there was no significant enemy contact, more than 500 South Vietnamese civilians, old men, women, children, and infants, Lay dead, killed by the men of Charlie Company. Evidence of what was clearly a war crime was covered up for over a year, but eventually it came to light, resulting in a high-level investigation by the Army, not only of the massacre, but also of the cover-up. Thirteen officers and enlisted men were charged with war crimes. Another 12 officers were charged with having actively covered up the murders. Ultimately, however, only six soldiers were prosecuted courts martial and only one of those tried was found guilty. My Lai became a flashpoint in the debate over American involvement in Vietnam, and it continues to have implications for contemporary military operations today. So what we have here is a distinguished panel of leading historians and, and military legal experts to discuss the important lessons and legacies of the My Lai massacre. I will briefly introduce our panel members for more information on their impressive backgrounds. I refer you to the program. We will begin today, and I'll introduce them in order that they will be speaking. First, Eric B. Villard, military historian with the U.S. Army Center of Military History at Fort McNair. He is the author of the recently published book, Combat Operations, Staying the Course, October 1967 to September 1968. And he will be talking about the strategic and operational overview. Our second presenter will be Colonel Retired Fred Borch III who was a career military lawyer in the U.S. Army JAG Corps, serving from 1980 until 2005. He is currently historian and archivist for the JAG Corps, and he is the author of a number of books and articles on legal and non-legal topics. He will talk about the Cali case. <clears throat> Our third presenter is Gary, Dr. Gary Solis, who is a retired Marine with 26 years of active duty, twice serving in Vietnam as an armor officer, he also served as a Marine judge advocate and court martial judge for 18 years. He is currently an adjunct professor of law at West Point, Georgetown, and George Washington. He is the author of a number of books on military operations in the land of, of uh, law of land warfare. He will be talking about the other cases involved in, in the My Lai massacre. 
And our last presenter is Brigadier General Joseph B. Berger, who is the Commander, United States Legal, United States Army Legal Services Agency and Chief Judge, U.S. Army Court of Criminal Appeals. He is a West Point graduate and has served in his present position since June 2017. <coughs> Additionally, he has served in Germany, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, and a number of stateside appointments. Before Dr. Villard begins his remarks, perhaps a bit of rules on the rules of engagement. Once all the remarks are completed, we will take questions from the floor. There will be personnel here from CSIS and from uh, CMH who will be circulating the room and collecting your questions on the cards provided. They will collect the cards and give them to me. Please indicate your name, affiliation, and to whom you are addressing your question, whether it be to a specific panelist or the panel in general. So without further ado, Eric, the floor is yours. Testing, testing. All right, uh, again, thank you all for being here. I mean, this is, uh, this is really incredible that we have a full room like this. I've been to CSIS now a few times, and this is capacity crowd, so I'm, I'm glad you're here for this very important event. Uh, I'm here just to give you uh, a, bit, a little, bit, little bit of background on the strategic and operational situation um, prior to the My Lai massacre. So I'll give you a little background on, on the setting and the opposing sides. Uh, Quang Nai province, uh, that the province we're talking about, is in the northern part of what was then South Vietnam. Going back to the first Indochina War, when the French uh, still controlled Vietnam as a colony, uh, most of the countryside in Quang Nai province was under control of the Viet Minh, who were the predecessors of the Viet Cong. Um, much like you would see uh, in 1968, uh, in, in 1950, 1952, the government controlled basically the regional towns and a thin strip of territory along Highway 1, which was the main north-south south road that ran through the coastal lowlands. Uh, so in that respect, not a lot had actually changed. But in 1954, through the Geneva Accords, that um, created a ceasefire and, and for France to withdraw from the country, um, the terms of the accord created a temporary division of the country between north and south and a period of time where people could move from one area to the other because the north would be controlled by Ho Chi Minh's Communist Party and the south would be controlled by a non-communist uh, government. The idea being that there would be national elections in 1956 to decide the issues of reunification. So in Quang Nai province, most of those Viet Cong soldiers and cadre went north um, after 1954. Um, the idea being that they would go north for additional military training and ideological preparation um, for future contingencies. But at the time, the, the idea was that the Viet Minh who remained in Quang Nai would stay there to organize the political um, struggle prior to the elections. Well, I think as we know, um, those elections never took place. Uh, Ngo Dinh Diem uh, became the president of South Vietnam. He called off the elections because he felt, probably correctly, uh, that there was no chance that they would be um, uh, free and fair and would probably go to the communists. And by 1956, he began a very vigorous, indeed brutal, campaign to exterminate the Viet Minh who had stayed behind. And so in Quang Nai province from 56 to 59 was a very bleak time for the communists. Um, majority of them were hunted down uh, and killed or arrested. So in 1959, North Vietnam decides uh, to begin supporting an armed insurgency in the South because the, the Southern cadre were just getting clobbered. <clears throat> so in 59, they began um, sending troops and material, first very small numbers, but growing numbers in the years to come. By 61, there were battalion-sized units, now we're calling them Viet Cong, although that's not what they called themselves. They called themselves the People Liberation Armed Forces, uh, battalion-sized units operating in Quang Nai province. And by 1965, when the United States intervened militarily, Quang Nai had once again become a communist stronghold. Uh, just the other day, I actually found um, an after action report from an operation in early 65. Um, some American advisors were, were part of this. It was a South Vietnamese operation, but it was in San Mi Village. 
And the scheme and maneuver was almost exactly like it would be in 1968. And you read the report, and they said, when we went into this village, there's tunnels everywhere, there's booby traps everywhere, and there's nobody, there's no men. So by 65, you really have, um, the, you, you have this communist stronghold very much in evidence. So moving forward, um, as the war expanded, um, by late 67, the American troop commitment is, is, is going towards half a million. Um, on its way to 525,000, which was the uh, authorized limit at the time. Uh, in this area of the country, Southern I Corps, as it became known, four military zones in South Vietnam, and I Corps was the northernmost five provinces. So Quang Nai was the southern part of I Corps. Uh, the principal American force in the region was um, first something called Task Force Oregon, which was a conglomeration of brigades that were kind of thrown together to bring more security to this region, and that transformed into the Americal Division. So by you know the end of 67, beginning of 68, you have this new division that is still forming, and it is based around the 196th Brigade, which had been in country for several years now, was, was pretty experienced. Um, but then two new infantry brigades, which had been raised specifically to fight in Vietnam. Uh, the 11th, which was trained in Hawaii, and the 198th, which is trained in Texas. So you have these three light infantry brigades covering really the southern half of I Corps. It's a big stretch of territory um, from the lower part of Quang Nam through Quang Tin and Quang Nai province. Uh, the, uh, these new units, the 11th and 198th, um, arrived just basically at the end of 1967. So they're new, newly arrived in country. And some of our other authors will talk about some of the training issues they had. <clears throat> but um, the arrangement was that um, part of this unit, the Americal, would protect the southern uh, districts in Quang Nai. And then part of it would, would protect the northern district. So particularly Bin San in the northeast, uh, just on the Quang Tin border, um, was, was an area for the Americal. Uh, initially, the 198th Brigade took control of it when the South, Marine, uh, the South Korean 2nd Marine Brigade moved farther north. So this switch happens in around January uh, that the Americal comes into this, this district. And um, within a few weeks, they create this special task force, Task Force Barker, um, made of three companies from different um, uh, battalions or diff different uh, of, of the regiments um, to protect this area. So the thing to, to keep in mind here is that this is a new division, which is still coming into being, um, and you have this um, particular area, which is now under the you know jurisdiction of not even a true you know brigade, but in fact you know a number of battalions and companies uh, drawn from different parts of the division. The um, the main focus of uh, this area it was a guerrilla and Viet Cong local force war. Uh, there were several NVA divisions operating in Southern I Corps and Northern II Corps, and they're fed from the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And there's a number of base areas in Quang Nai province where these big divisions would go back to, um, to, to get supplies and uh, ammunition. But it was these, um, what they call local force battalions, these Viet Cong battalions, particularly the 48th that we've heard about, <clears throat> their responsibility was to operate in a sp specific district and create, act as a link between the local population and these larger NVA units. So like the 48th Local Force Battalion um, would, for example, um, uh, conduct attacks in conjunction with these big NVA units, which were under uh, control of the B1 front. Um, but they would also support the local guerrillas. So you might think of it as single A baseball, double A, triple A, and the majors, right? 
So the local force guys, they're like double A, right? And then you got the triple A, that's the provincial battalions. And then you got the majors, that's, that's the, you know, the big NVA divisions. And the single A are these local guerrilla companies. So that's the 48th. Um, it's, it's operating, again, in, in a relatively um, constrained area and has very close ties to the population. That's where it's getting the food. These big NVA divisions are getting their men and weapons and ammo from the trail, but not their food. That's grown locally. So the 48th is the one that's helping uh, arrange that. So the... The, the, the thing that really changes the dynamic here and kind of sets the stage for, for the, the My Lai uh, massacre is the Tet Offensive. Uh, one, of the, one of the big initiatives in 1967 was uh, the Revolutionary Development Program. You might think pacification, essentially. This is a South Vietnamese government effort to put these teams into select hamlets to help secure them, teach literacy, dig wells, do all the things that you'd want to do to bring that hamlet under government control. So this was a big initiative, and in Quang Nai, they were having a really hard time um, getting, um, okay, okay, that's fine, okay. Um, it really had a hard time getting, um, that sounds better, uh, getting a, a a foothold in, in, in the countryside because, uh, again, if you, once you got off of Highway 1 outside the regional towns, there wasn't much of a government presence. So there was a big initiative to try to, to finally uh, turn that tide. When the Tet Offensive happened, uh, it was a national, uh, nationwide attacks. The 48th Battalion and every other VC unit in uh, Quang Nai Province uh, participates in attacks on regional towns and the regional capital, like Quang Nai Province. Uh, the South Vietnamese drive back those attacks, the 48th is, is, is hurt quite badly in the process. So after Tet, there is a real desire at MACV to get after these Viet Cong units that had been so badly damaged during the Tet Offensive and knock them out, you know, once and for, for all, so that this revolution, revolutionary development program could in fact start to get some headway. And so that was the, that was the concept behind um, Task Force Barker and what it was doing in February and March, is to seek out whoever the biggest threat was locally. In this case, that was the 48th Battalion. Uh, this is a battalion which, which had attacked and overrun district headquarters before, attacked Quang Nai City, um, had generally had, you know, three, four, 500 men, but was down to about 100 now, apparently. So the, the thought was, okay, Let's go and clear them out. And where did they go? Where was their rear area? Where did they go to lick their wounds? That was Santin District and places like Mi Lai. So that's why the American Division asked for the authority to operate outside of its normal zone. Right? Muscatine was Bin San District, but not Santin. So they said, you know, because this is important, we want an extension. We want to op operate in a place where we don't normally operate. And that was the thinking behind this operation. Um, so, with, uh, with with that in mind, in, in you know, in the March time frame, uh, the you know the the push to get the RD program back on track was you know was visible throughout the country. And so, the it was the American units really you know who had the mobility, who had the firepower to go into these normally VC areas where the South Vietnamese troops didn't like to go. And so that, that was why the America was operating in this area. It had the ability to do things the government didn't. And with all the dislocation of Tet, uh, there was a lot of pressure coming down, you know, to General Coster at the American Division and every other division commander, you know, to, to turn this thing around. So that was also something to keep, you know, keep in mind, uh, a sense of real urgency. Um, that something had to be done, and the VC had never been so weak. So here was an opportunity, hopefully, they thought, to take out um, what had been a real thorn in their side. And with that, I will pass to the next person. Thank you, Eric. Chris? Okay, uh, good afternoon, one and all. Uh, it's not an accident that you're here today, because tomorrow 
is 50 years to the day that the killings occurred at My Lai. Uh, and others are also going to remember this tomorrow. In fact, on Tuesday, I got a phone call at my office at the Army's Legal Center in school. A reporter from the German Broadcasting Network, Deutsche Welle, wanting to do an interview with me about Mi Lai, recognizing that the anniversary was coming up. So I think tomorrow, which is the actual 50-year mark, you'll be reading about Mi Lai. And obviously, it is important, uh, although it happened a half a century ago. As I look out here, I see that some of you in the room were alive a half century ago, uh, including me. I was a teenager. Uh, so I remember. I remember me lie. Well, not, he's only 29 or so. Uh, but most Americans don't remember me lie and will give you a rather puzzled look if you say, Rusty Callie. So I want to talk about three things. First thing I want to do is talk a little bit about Rusty Callie, Lieutenant Callie, who was court-martialed at Fort Benning, Georgia. I want to talk a little bit about what happened on March 16th. 1968, and then finish up part three of my remarks, the aftermath of the Cali case. So a little bit about William Laws, Rusty, Cali, known as Rusty because of his red hair. Uh, not a big man, uh, five foot, I think three or four. Uh, not a very good student, finished 666th in his high school class of 731. Some of you might think 666 is not a coincidence. Uh, and at OCS, at Officer Candidate School, finished in the bottom quarter of his class. So for those of you who know something about Army OCS, it's a way for deserving men and women to get a commission. Uh, three ways to get a commission, obviously, or four you can Go to one of the academies, uh, ROTC, OCS, and we do have some direct appointees. Today, you have to have a college degree to get into Army OCS. Back in Cali's era, you didn't even have to be a high school graduate. Uh, Cali was very much a low quality kind of officer, but we needed officers in 1968. He had some schooling, military schooling. Uh, in Georgia, uh, and that was enough to get him in. But again, finished in the bottom quarter of his class. So on March 16, 1968, Second Lieutenant Cali is in Vietnam with the AmeriCal Division in Charlie Company, commanded by Captain Ernest Medina, and he's going on what they fully expect to be a serious mission. Intelligence is that they're going to be facing the 48th VC battalion, as uh, Dr. Villard talked about, told they're going to be outnumbered two to one. You can expect sniper fire. You can expect this is going to be tough, uh, and it's going to be a real fight. And so Callie and the soldiers are nervous. They're afraid. As Dr. Villard said, uh, Tet has already happened. Uh, but somewhat ironically, the men in this particular platoon, in this particular company, didn't have any combat during Tet. They're still untested. But there had been some soldiers in the unit who'd been harmed, injured by uh, booby traps, and a very popular sergeant in the company had been killed a couple of days earlier. Uh, and so the soldiers are nervous, they're anticipating uh, a big fight, and that isn't what happened. They're airlifted in by helicopter, they get to the hamlet of My Lai about 7 a.m. in the morning, and there's no fire coming their way, there's no sign of enemy action at all. There are no booby traps. There are no mines. They're in a small village, and all they find are women, old men, and children, no military-age males, 
and these young, uh, these people are going around there about their daily chores, having breakfast, uh, and getting ready to do what they do in the village. And so from the beginning, the soldiers are really confused about what they need to do. And an important point is, no one ever instructed Cali or his men what to do if all they encountered were unresisting, unarmed civilians. They come into the village and almost immediately uh, some soldiers begin to kill livestock, uh, throw grenades into hooches, uh, and Callie and the men begin to round up uh, civilians and put them in, uh, in areas in the village. One particular area is by a ditch, and at some point Kelly comes along to a private first class by the name of Meadlo, and he says to Meadlo, uh, how about taking care of these villagers? And then Kelly walks away, and sometime later he returns and says to Meadlo, I thought I told you to take care of these villagers. And Meadlo says, well, we are taking care of them. We're, we're watching them. And Kelly replies, no, I mean kill them. And so there were, in the next couple of minutes, Callie and Meadlo open up on the unresisting, unarmed villagers with their M16s and begin to kill them. And by the 11 a.m. mark, four hours after they've entered the village, as Dr. Villard said, between 350 and 500 civilians have been killed by Cali and his men. There were certainly some soldiers who refused to open fire on these civilians, uh, but most of the men in the platoon, of whom there were about 20, uh, did so. And the result was uh, this horrendous massacre, this horrendous war crime, uh, a real tragedy. Um, a couple of things are important here. The first thing is that while the massacre, while the killing was going on, a helicopter, a small observation helicopter, a Raven, was called at the time, piloted by Warrant Officer Hugh Thompson, who was providing really observation for the ongoing mission. Hugh Thompson saw what was going on down below. He saw there were at least 150 bodies and he was so upset, he landed his helicopter on the ground between a group of American soldiers who were chasing fleeing Vietnamese to put a stop to it. And he instructed his door gunner, a man by a soldier by the name of Larry Colburn, that if when Thompson went to talk to the Americans, if they did not break off their chase, that they were to open fire on the Americans. Fortunately, it did not come to that. Uh, Thompson had a very tense conversation with a second lieutenant who we believe was not Callie, uh, but a lieutenant by the name of Brooks, who was subsequently killed in action, and they did break off the chase. Uh, Thompson therefore saved some lives. He also able, was able later to evacuate on his helicopter a number of Vietnamese uh, children uh, thereby probably saving their lives. Thompson is really one of the true heroes of the day and is later decorated by the Army, unfortunately quite a few years later, recognized for his non-combat combat heroism with the Soldier's Medal. Um, Professor Solis will talk about some of these uh, individuals, but the company commander is Captain Medina, He's not actually in My Lai, but he and his first sergeant are adjacent to the village. Certainly every reason to believe that Medina and his first sergeant knew what was going on. Medina, by the way, is a decorated uh, combat veteran, Silver Star, uh, well liked by his men. Task Force Barker, as uh, Dr. Villard said, is named after Lieutenant Colonel Barker, who was the battalion commander. Uh, Barker is later killed in a helicopter crash, and that's one of the reasons that we never talk about a court-martial for Barker. 
The brigade commander is a Colonel Henderson. He's only been in command from the day before, the day before. Uh, and then finally, the AmeriCal uh, division commander is Samuel Coster. He's a fast burner, protege of Westmoreland, going places. In fact, Coster is the superintendent at the military academy after Vietnam. So this is what happens that particular day. Callie and his men open fire on these unarmed, unresisting villagers and kill between 350 and 500. We're not really sure how many because of the cover-up that happens almost immediately. At every level of the brigade staff and the division staff, officers cover up the war crime, cover it up either by intentionally failing to investigate the war crime or report it to higher authority as was required by Military Assistance Command Vietnam directives. You were required by MACV directives to report all suspected war crimes and investigate them. But almost immediately, Colonel Henderson reports to Major General Coster that at most maybe 20 non-combatants have been killed and if you hear otherwise it's just VC propaganda. So it is covered up and it's not until April 1969 that another real hero in this episode uh, changes things, and that's a sergeant by the name of Ron Reidenauer. And Reidenauer had not been at My Lai, had not participated in the military operation, but he knew some of the soldiers who had been there, and he began to hear about this massacre, uh, in which a lieutenant by the name of Kelly, as he spelled it in his subsequent letters, K-A-L-L-Y, had taken part. And Reidenauer has such a sense of justice that he writes a letter to the president, the White House, 23 members of Congress, the chief of staff of the army, everyone he can think of saying, we've got to take a look at, look at this, look at this war crime. General Westmoreland, who's chief of staff of the army at this point, gets the letter uh, and immediately instructs his inspector general to begin doing an investigation. That happens, there is an investigation, uh, and we begin to uncover the war crime. There's also a subsequent investigation headed by Lieutenant General Ray Pierce, the very famous Pierce Inquiry uh, that looks into the atrocity, and the Pierce Inquiry is really the gold standard when it comes to understanding what happened at My Lai. Kelly obviously is identified as someone who's actually a trigger puller here. Charges are preferred against Kelly in uh, November 1969. So the massacre, the event, March 16th, 1968, Ridenauer's letters don't start coming in for 13 months later. And then Kelly is charged November 1969 and he is prosecuted at Fort Benning. Trial opens in November 1970. November 1970. Piers actually recommends charges against about 25 others, and Professor Solis uh, will talk about some of these other cases. Only six are court-martialed, of whom Cowley is the only man to be convicted. So the case opens at Fort Benning, Georgia, and two rather inexperienced judge advocates in the sense that their army lawyers in their first tours as JAGs are given this case to prosecute, which looking back today I think is quite mind-boggling, but I guess lawyers were really good back then. Uh, a lot of pressure in bringing this case, and what's their big fear as prosecutors? Their big fear is jury nullification. You'll remember the Vietnam War has very much split the country. A lot of arguments about why we should be there and is Cali a scapegoat and 
uh, and the result is uh, a lot of pressure, a lot of beliefs that maybe there'll be jury nullification here. Uh, the government puts on its case, and the defense case is, uh, well, the government's case is Callie murdered these people when he shot them. He and his other conspirators, co-conspirators, he's charged with murder. The defense is Callie was only following orders. Callie insists that he only killed the villagers because Captain Medina ordered him to kill everyone in the village. Not surprisingly, when Medina testifies, he says, I never gave that order. Why would I tell someone to kill civilians? The jury sees it the government's way, and Callie is convicted of premeditated murder, and the finding comes back March 29th, 1971, but it wasn't really an easy case. The jury of six, a colonel, four majors, and a captain, spent 79 hours in deliberation. 79 hours in deliberation. So we can talk more about the case later, but let me just tell you that in an unprecedented move after Cowley is convicted, the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, interferes in the case and directs from the White House that Cowley will not be sent to Leavenworth, but he will be put in his on-post quarters where he will be able to live in sort of a house arrest situation pending the outcome of the case. And so as the case winds its way through the system, uh, Nixon eventually decides to take no more action. Kelly has been found guilty of premeditated murder. He's sentenced to life, confinement at hard labor for life. But the convening authority in the case, the general who put the case together, when he takes final action, reduces the case to the sentence to 20 years. And then the secretary of the army later reduces it to 10 years. Callie's gone to Leavenworth by now, but under the rules as they existed at the time, once you'd served a third of your sentence, you were eligible for parole. So if you added the six months he spent at Leavenworth, plus his time under house arrest, Callie's eligible for parole, and he is paroled, 9 November 1974. You often hear that Nixon pardoned or commuted Callie's sentence, not true. But he did interfere in the case, and as a result, Callie did not go immediately to Leavenworth. Thank you very much. Professor Solis. Chance, ladies. The fact that military justice didn't make sure the fact is that military justice didn't make sure that those responsible for Milai and its cover-up were properly punished. I feel that those trials and non-trial results are totally inequitable. That's a quote from Lieutenant General William Pierce, who conducted the Pierce investigation. I'm with General Pierce, who led the 92-strong team that definitively investigated Milai. It was Pierce who brought charges against those soldiers who were tried for Milai as trigger pullers and against officers who covered it up for more than a year. How many unarmed and defenseless Vietnamese old men and women children were murdered? How many women and young children were raped and gang raped? How many of those women and young female children had their vaginas ripped by bayonets wielded by Cali's soldiers? In 1970, the American public never heard about those sexual offenses. But it's the epic failure of American military justice that I will discuss. I was a Marine judge advocate for 18 years. In the early 1970s, military courtrooms were overflowing with courts, courts martial. Administrative discharges were rare. Desertions and drugs were the order of the day, with violent racial conflict the constant background. Fraggings weren't unusual. Court martial numbers were at record highs. 
to establish my military law bona fides from 1972 through 76, I prosecuted 433 courts martials. I never defended. As a military judge in the mid 80s, I heard another 331 cases. And in the 70s, as a young lawyer, I'd already been in the Corps for eight years, I heard the details of the My Lai cases. I understood what had happened, and I was appalled. I remain appalled. The, military, the My Lai cases were American military justice's darkest day because of the My Lai cases that were not tried, the My Lai cases that were poorly tried, and the My Lai cases that were buried by senior officers. We know that the Milari war crimes occurred on 16 March 1968. On 24 November 1969, General Westmoreland appointed Lieutenant General William Pierce to investigate the Milai war crimes. Congressman Mendel Rivers convened his Armed Services Committee and announced hearings regarding Milai through an investigative subcommittee, which will play a role in a moment. On 17 March of 1970, General Pierce's investigation report was released to the public. Twelve officers were charged with UCMJ. I didn't start my clock. Clever. <laughs> Twelve officers were charged with UCMJ cover-up offenses. The convening authority, the general officer who has the authority to make a court-martial happen, was Lieutenant General Jonathan Seaman, commanding general of the First Army. After February of 1971, Seaman was replaced as com uh, commanding general and convening authority by Lieutenant General Claire Hutchin. Twelve cases charging Milai cover-up were preferred by Lieutenant General Pierce and sent to General Seaman's First Army Headquarters for referrals to a court-martial. Only one of them made it to court-martial. Thirteen additional charges for war crimes for the trigger pullers were sent to Lieutenant General Albert Connor, commanding general of the Third Army. A total of 25 cases, every one of them already complete with charges brought by Pierce. A three-star general tested in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam combat. He was supported by a 92-man team of investigators that included military and civilian lawyers, all of whom walked the ground at My Lai, taking sworn statements from surviving Vietnamese victims as well as every U.S. soldier involved in the My Lai operations. Over the next three years, the 12 officers charged with My Lai cover-ups, plus two chaplains not previously mentioned, fared well. First, Major General Samuel Coster. We've already heard about General Coster. His charges were dismissed by General Seaman the day before General Seaman retired. He did issue a letter of censure to General Coster, and Secretary of the Army reduced him to Brigadier General and withdrew his Distinguished Service Medal, and he was relieved as superintendent at West Point. When I tell cadets that at West Point, they can't believe that a soup was relieved. <clears throat> General Pierce wrote, I was especially disturbed by General Seaman's dismissal of charges against the senior officers, especially in General Coster's case. In effect, it was a travesty of justice that would establish a precedent that would be difficult for the Army to live down. Yet other officers charged with the cover-up did better. Lieutenant Colonel William Ginn, accused of failure to obey a lawful order and dereliction of duty, charges dismissed prior to trial. Major David G. Gavin, failure to obey a lawful order, dereliction of duty, false official statement, charges dismissed prior to trial. Major Frederick Watke, failure to obey a lawful order, dereliction of duty, charges dismissed prior to trial. Major Charles Calhoun, dereliction of duty, disobedience of a lawful order to report possible war crimes, charges dismissed prior to trial. Lieutenant Kenneth Boatman, disobedience of a lawful order to report possible war crimes, charges dismissed prior to trial. Lieutenant Dennis Johnson, failure to obey a lawful order, yes, charges dismissed prior to trial. And Captain Carl Creswell, Chaplain Corps, United States Navy, excuse me, Army. Creswell told his superior, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis, of Warren Officer Thompson's observations from his helicopter over My Lai. Creswell told no one else, as he was required to do by a standing order, only his boss. The charge, disobedience of a lawful order, was dismissed by Secretary of the Army Stanley Reasoner, Reasoner before the case even reached General Seaman. Lieutenant Colonel Francis Lewis, Division Chaplain, like Chaplain Creswell, disobedience of a lawful order, dismissed 
by Secretary of the Army Resort. Even more disturbing to anyone even slightly familiar with military justice, four of the charged cover-up officers' cases were dismissed without an Article 32 investigation having been held. An Article 32 is a preliminary, a preliminary, a required preliminary before any general court-martial. It's, uh, it's been said to be akin to a grand jury proceeding to determine whether or not there's probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed and has been committed by this individual. General George Young, the assistant, uh, Brigadier General George Young, assistant division commander of the Americal Division, General Seaman dismissed all of his charges as unsupported by the evidence without an Article 32 investigation. Colonel Nels Parson, failure to obey a lawful order, dereliction of duty, dismissed without an Article 32. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Looper, failure to obey a lawful order, dismissed charges without an Article 32. Major Robert McKnight, false official statement, dismissed without a 32. Why were these four officers not parties to an Article 32 investigation? How did General Seaman, uh, Seaman determine that there was insufficient evidence to take them to trial? the reason given for the dismissal of charges, when he didn't convene the very proceeding designed to make that determination? We'll never know. Neither the UCMJ nor DOD orders require a convening authority to detail the reasons for their decisions. I've located no writing by General Seaman or his successor, General Hutchin, to explain how General Pierce could have found probable cause to charge 14 officers, counting the two chaplains, and been wrong in 13 of those 14 cases. The 14th officer's uh, cover-up case, it went to trial. Colonel Oren Henderson, commander of the 11th Infantry Brigade, accused of dereliction of duty, failure to obey a lawful order to report war crimes, and false official statement. He was tried by a general court-martial with members, which that is a jury, which resulted in his acquittal. The acquittal very strongly smacks of jury nullification, but we can't know that as fact. General Pierce said of Colonel Henderson's acquittal, if his actions are judged as acceptable standards for an officer in his position, the Army is indeed in deep trouble. Then there were the 13 additional charges of war crime cases involving four officers and nine enlisted men. They also fared well through the good graces of another convening authority, Lieutenant General Albert Connor. For example, Sergeant Esquil Torres charged with murder, charges dismissed before trial. He was discharged at the convenience of the government with an honorable discharge. Private Max Hudson, charge of murder, dismissed before trial. Discharged with the convenience of the government under honorable conditions. Spec 4, Robert Sobis, charge of murder, dismissed before trial, honorable discharge. Private Gerald Smith, murder, dismissed before trial, honorable discharge. Sergeant Kenneth Hodges, charge of assault, dismissed. Discharge, convenience of the government, honorable conditions. Spec 4, William Doherty, murder charge, honorable discharge. Kenneth Scheel, corporal, murder charge, dismissed. Discharge under, uh, under honorable conditions. First Lieutenant Thomas Willingham, charges of false, false official statement, failure to report a felony, dismissed prior to trial, honorable discharge. Were there 32, Article 32 investigations in those eight dismissed cases? I've not been able to locate any source that mentions Article 32s. I suspect that none of the eight soldiers mentioned did have an Article 32 to determine probable cause of whether or not they had indeed committed an offense. Colonel Henderson had been uh, tried and acquitted. Charges were dismissed prior to trial in 21 other Mili cases, counting the two chaplains. That left five cases, and all five were tried at general courts marshals with members. Sergeant David Mitchell, charged with assault with intent to commit murder. Congressman Mendel Rivers Investigative Subcommittee refused to provide Mitchell's defense team with the transcripts of testimony of four prospective cross, uh, prosecution witnesses before the subcommittee. The transcripts were needed by Mitchell's defense team for their cross-examination of the four. The congressional refusal was held to be a government violation of the Jenks Act, which pre requires military lawyers to produce defense-oriented uh, evidence for the defense, resulted in the court's order that no witness who had appeared before the subcommittee would be allowed to testify at his court-martial. Thus, the prosecution was fatally wounded. Mitchell was acquitted. Sergeant Charles Hutto, the second of the five cases, charged with assault with intent to commit murder, charges of rape and murder had been dismissed prior to trial, he was acquitted by members, despite Hutto's written sworn statement that he had killed a group 
of unarmed civilians with his M60 machine gun. The statement was admitted into evidence and read to the members. The members took less than an hour to acquit. Captain Eugene Katok, charged with maiming and assault. Katok was charged with using a Bowie knife and questioning a VC suspect, during which time he cut off the tip of his finger. Katok claimed it was an accident. The members took less than an hour to acquit. Here's the interesting case, in my opinion. Captain Ernest Medina, the CEO of Company C, 1st Battalion, CEO of Cowley's Platoon, as you know. He was charged with aggravated assault times two, premeditated murder of not fewer than 100 Vietnamese in My Lai, and premeditated murder of an adult female and a male child. A charge of failure to obey a lawful order as well was, in, <coughs> excuse me, a char charge of failure to obey a lawful order was inexplicably, inexplicably, got it, dropped before trial. The case was defended by F. Lee Bailey at the time a very prominent defense counsel. Medina was not charged, not charged with making a false official statement, UCMJ Article 107, or with dereliction of duty, Article 92, or with disobedience of a lawful order to report a war crime, Article 92, or with mispresent of a felony, Article 134. All seemingly viable charges. Instead, he was charged as a principal to murder, Article 77, requiring for conviction as an aider or a better that the accused shared the criminal intent of the perpetrator. Now, proving specific intent is always a challenge. Proving it in, to a co-actor once removed from the alleged principal actor is a very high bar for a prosecutor. That was a very strange charge to bring. The prosecutor failed to call former soldiers, such as Paul Meadlow and Jay Roberts, whose testimonies in earlier proceedings placed Medina within Milai when the killing was going on. Nor could the prosecutor get Haberly's Milai photographs into evidence, although they were on the cover of Life magazine. A trial observer was the then prominent writer and commentator Mary McCarthy. She wrote, quote, Despite the prosecutor's familiarity, one would think, by this time with the My Lai matter, they appeared poorly prepared and were repeatedly surprised by their own witnesses, as well as scolded, guided, and corrected by the judge. Close quote. An LA Times reporter noted that, quote, many observers thought the prosecutors were simply not up to a contest with Bailey, the noted defense counsel. Close quote. Pursuant to the prosecutor's request, the prosecutor's request, the military judge instructed the members, the jury, that the accused could be convicted only if he knew his men were committing or were about to commit war crimes and he failed to stop the acts. The military judge emphasized that actual knowledge, actual knowledge was required. Actual knowledge was not then and is not today an element of aiding or abetting as requested by the defense. And like specific intent, proving actual knowledge is a high bar for a prosecutor. On 22 September 1971, the members deliberated for an hour again before acquitting Captain Medina. The Medina prosecutor wrote in a law review article, the prosecutor, quote, the prosecutorial record of the My Lai cases was abysmal, close quote. Having lost three of the six My Lai cases that went to trial, he should know. We've heard about the case of Lieutenant William Cowley. The trial counsel in that case was Captain Aubrey Daniel. Finally, at the right moment, and I know that Fred agrees with me, finally, at the right moment in history, the military justice system got it right. Uh, Aubrey D Daniel, 25 years old, was pitch perfect throughout the Cowley trial. Thorough, methodical, spectacularly competent. He outlawed everyone in the room, including the very capable military judge. So, Seven soldiers, at least, should be remembered at My Lai who refused to obey orders to kill. Sergeant Michael Bernhardt, Herbert Carter, Robert Maples, Dennis Bunting, Joseph Dursey, Larry Polston, and Leonard Gonzalez all refused orders to kill unarmed civilians. The courage of helicopter pilot Warrant Officer Hugh Thompson was beyond heroic. So, of the 27 My Lai cases, again counting the two chaplains who usually are not counted, 21 were dismissed before trial. 21 cases were entirely dismissed before trial. 
At least four of those dismissals without, are, were without Article 32 investigations. Six cases went to trial, five of them resulting in acquittal. Three of the five acquittals were prosecuted by one judge advocate. A trial lawyer's axiom is no trial is too hard for the lawyer who doesn't have to try it. Still, the judge advocate's first loss was Hutto whose acquittal sounds very much like ju uh, ju uh, jury nullification, and if it wasn't, it certainly rhymes. The prosecutor can't be faulted for losing Hutto. The reasons for his second acquittal, that of Captain Katoke, are unknown because there was le very little media coverage and courts martial acquittals have no verbatim record of trial, as do convictions. Only a summarized record, usually less than a page long. So there's no way to examine the Katok record to reflect on the trial tactics and legal stratagems. It looks like a fairly simple prosecution case, but we weren't there. Captain Medina's case is another matter. Through an though a, an acquittal leaves no verbatim record to examine, media coverage of Medina's case tells a damning story. More significantly, the questions raised by the government's charges suggest a legally deficient approach to the case from the outset. Combine those points with the prosecutor's own writings on his prosecution of the case, and it appears that the government's trial strategy and command of military law were lacking, from selection of charges to jury instructions. In my opinion, Medina was a winnable case lost through prosecutorial ineptitude. The final element making the Milai trials an epic failure of military justice are the cases that were not charged, the conduct that went unexamined, let alone tried. Two non-cases, for example, were those of Gary Rosevich and Dennis Conti. Few in this room have heard those, those names, but they were among the worst uniformed criminals in Milai. Rosevich allegedly forced a group of women to strip and then murdered them with an M79 flechette round when they failed, when they refused to have sex with him. Conti allegedly forced a woman to perform oral sex by holding a gun to the head of her child, an event sworn to by Cali in his trial yet they were never charged, despite sworn statements to CID describing their criminal conduct. Is there a reason they weren't charged? I believe there is, although it could never be proven. I believe higher military authorities didn't charge them for the same reasons they dropped 21 of 27 cases before trial, because they didn't want the American public to know the full extent of the criminality exhibited by US personnel in Milai and undermine America's ongoing war effort. I believe that was the reason not a single rape charge went to trial, why sexual mutilation charges were not even considered. I believe the convening authorities just wanted the whole damn Me Lai case to go away with as little media attention as possible. Thus, 21 Me Lai cases with sworn charges sworn to by a combat hardened Lieutenant General who was supported by a hand-picked team of military lawyers were dismissed without trial, without legal explanation, thus assuring no trials, no publicity, no national outcry. The tragedy of Milai didn't end when the last round was fired. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope to be able in the next few minutes to show you that we, as your Army today, have the ability to listen, absorb, learn from, and act on the lessons of the past. I hope to be the good news coda to this story today. Cicero famously asked whether or not laws are silent in time of war. I think the answer is absolutely not. But there are prerequisites in order to have an Army and in order to fight a war such that the law and the rule of law remains. It requires a professional, disciplined army with institutionalized training and self-policing. It requires knowledge of the law of armed conflict to be treated as a core competency among professional soldiers. And it requires leadership. It requires officers and NCOs who are adequate in character to the task at hand. And when we look back in history and we look back at the Pierce inquiry and what Lieutenant General Pierce found, he found that we lacked a professional disciplined army, a reliance on draftees, abbreviated training for officers. Again, not a single cause in and of itself, but certainly a contributing factor. We lacked proper training, training that was described as lackadaisical, as card-based. 
We were joking earlier that if you gave a soldier a card with rules of engagement on it, well, it doesn't hold up well till about 12 minutes in the field when it's soaking wet and turns into a pile of pulp. And so even if that soldier were so inclined to look at the reference, and most wouldn't be, it would be gone, lost to them. And then there was the lack of, uh, lack of leadership, adequate in character. Not just Cali, but the cover-up and the failure to police our own ranks as a profession. So I tell you today there are three things I think you need to know about your army, about our army, that have fundamentally changed. Those things that give us the moral, le legal, and ethical foundations to ensure the legitimacy of our operations. And as we sit here on the 6,003rd day in Afghanistan, fighting one of the longest wars in modern history, that moral, legal, and ethical foundation has got to remain solid. So what is it? What are those three things? It's the comprehensive, integrated nature of how we train and ensure compliance with the law of armed conflict. We do it from entry-level training all the way through our senior service colleges at our most at our highest level. For our sergeants majors at the sergeants major academy, we do it from cradle to grave. We do it in the classroom, we do it in practical exercises, and we incorporate it in our large scale training at our combat training centers. And we do it in every operation center around the globe. We'll come back to that in more detail. What else has changed? The second thing you know, need to know that's changed is the role of the judge advocate. And I got it, many in this room would cringe to think, really more lawyers, that's a solution. But I tell you, the people asking for more lawyers today are not the lawyers, they are the commanders. And I submit to you, it's not because these are commanders who are gun shy and who are afraid. I won't list names, but the commanders I've had the privilege of working for who have asked for more legal support are names that would resonate in this room and you would not find any of them shirking. It is the, the ability to be both the command's legal advisor in that strict left and right limit of what is the law, what are the policy limitations, but to be counsel. We can do it, but should we do it? And to be part of that commander's inner circle and to be part of that discussion beyond the can and could to the should. It's integration with the staff at every level and it's present in every formation from brigade up. Our brigade combat teams in the Army all have three judge advocates. They've got a major and they've got two captains and they have a series of number of paralegal NCOs underneath of them working across those formations. Different types of formations have different numbers beyond our BCTs, but we have lawyers at every echelon. And so with that, with that training, with the presence of those judge advocates and the quality of our junior leaders, the final thing that I think is required, especially our NCOs, we have an all volunteer army that invests heavily in the training and education of our force. And that makes the difference I think today. So what do we do differently now that we didn't do then? Well, in 1972, a judge advocate recommended to the judge advocate general out of the peers inquiry that we ought to have a law of war program. We ought to have what became the DOD law of war program. And in 1974, that program was codified. And it was critical because it was an initial step in changing the Army's mindset about the appropriate role to be played by attorneys in the military. But beyond that, it got to the training requirements. The professionalism of our force, of our junior officers, of our NCOs, would follow in time with the evolution of our all-volunteer Army. But those two additional things that go back to the three things I highlighted you need to know were critical. It became the precursor for what became known as operational law. And if you're involved in academe today, you'll hear it talked about as national security law. But over the last really 25, 30 years, it was the active evolution and the rapid evolution of operational law. That is judge advocates, the staff and commanders working together to ensure that operations were within compliance to our treaty obligations, to those fundamental principles of the law of armed conflict, as well as to our own national policy limitations that are part and parcel of every, every operation we are part of. 
It was DOD mandated, and it required extensive law of war training be provided to all armed forces personnel. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It also specifically mandated judge advocates must be involved in both the development and review of op plans in order to ensure that these plans comply with the law of war's requirements. A significant mindset change for the Army. And so at the time of the massacre, we were doing none of that. Today, that is part and parcel of how our Army and how our joint force conducts business every day without second thought and without hesitation around the globe. Qualified embedded legal advisors became a critical part of that. The DOD Law of War program in 1974 set out a requirement to make, legal, to make qualified legal advisors at all levels of command available to provide advice about law of war planning. So I've walked you through how we have lawyers at every level from brigade up. In our special forces units, we have lawyers at the battalion level. When we send battalion-sized task forces forward independently, they routinely go forward with a judge advocate, often a captain, occasionally a major, but trained. And I'll get to the training piece a little later. So within that program, we built that structure. And then we ensured that we trained that structure. And so we train our judge advocates and our paralegal non-commissioned officers. We train them at the basic course. We train them at our graduate course, which is our mid-level educational course. We train them in short courses. We train them in home station training. And that's the academic piece. We'll get to the operational training piece as we talk about how we train our forces. But in addition to structure and training, you've got to have action. You've got to have judge advocates who are in there and who are willing to advise. You have to have judge advocates who can speak truth to power and can tell a commander no when the answer is no, who can tell a commander yes when the answer is yes, and who in that gray area in between can help a commander understand where the left and right legal limit is and where the risk is and allow that commander who owns the decision to make a decision based on an informed risk assessment of which that judge advocate and the rest of the staff plays a critical role. So those judge advocates are tasked not only to address and identify those legal constraints, it's not all about no, it's about counsel. It's about the should we when we get past the could we. And so in addition to those, the other things we weren't doing were consolidated, integrated training. The peers report described training as lackadaisical, card-based. We talked about the fallacy of of a stack of cards in your pocket as a soldier that provide or pretend to give you guidance. Again, once they're wet, they're nothing but pulp. And how often do you sit and read them? Having had them in my pockets on deployments, I can tell you, you largely don't. But what I can tell you is our Army now is at a point where we don't need that ready reference day in and day out because it's part and parcel of how we train. Training begins, like I said, at the cradle. So whether that's in AIT for our soldiers, or whether that's in ROTC or at our academies, or OCS for our officers, it's comprehensive. At West Point, it's a combination of philosophy, military law, military science, field exercises, organizations at West Point like the Lieber Institute, named for Francis Lieber of Civil War fame, who wrote General Order 100, which was the framework for the law of war for our forces. And the Modern War Institute, proudly run by one of my West Point classmates, uh, who takes a look at bringing all of these components together, the challenges of the modern battlefield, the strictures under which we have to fight, and providing feedback and guidance to the field in an integrated fashion so that they can understand it. It's when you open the Soldier's Manual of Common Task, and subject number one is the individual conduct and the laws of war. And what it tasks soldiers to do is to identify suspected or known violations of the law of war and notify appropriate authorities. That's a basic level task we now require of entry level soldiers to understand that process, something that was absent at the time 50 years ago when these events transpired. We've integrated that training at our combat training centers. So whether you're at JRTC at Fort Polk, Louisiana, whether you're at 
NTC out at Fort Irwin or whether you're at MCTP at Fort Leavenworth, whatever type of formation you are, wherever you're conducting your training, your preparatory training at home station, and your training in each of those intense training environments all involve scenarios woven through that raise with and force commanders and soldiers to deal with these issues, to deal with issues of combatants on the battlefield, to deal with issues of treatment of detainees, treatment of prisoners, treatment of civilians who you need to remove from the battlefield in order to be able to identify and engage the enemy. We do that. We train at every course. We train at our pre-command course for our battalion and brigade commanders. We train at our advanced leader course for our senior NCOs. And like I said earlier, we train at our Sergeant's Major Academy. The training is different in every one of those venues because the knowledge, the base of knowledge those individuals are coming in with at that point in their career is different. The experience is different. But it all goes back to their ability to return to their formations and ensure that the most junior soldier understands what is expected of him or her in combat or in any operation, however categorized. And that's the rule for us. It doesn't necessarily have to strictly be a combat operation. All of this applied to us when we were in Kosovo as well. Any operation, however categorized, is the language of the regulation governing this. We take it seriously in everything we do. So what does that get you? Hopefully that gets you a program, and I submit to you it gives us a program today that ensures that soldiers understand they have multiple venues for reporting suspected allegations, whether it's to the chain of command, or if there's a fear the chain of command is involved, it's to an alternate chain of command, it's to a chaplain, it's to a judge advocate, it's to an inspector general, all of whom are present on the battlefield, all of whom are present at various levels in the various formations, but we give soldiers options. We give soldiers multiple ways to be able to do the right thing should the wrong thing have occurred. Now, that begs the question, if we've solved the problem, how can wrong things occur? Well, the reality is we're an army of human beings and we're an army that reflects the society in which each of us comes from. And so guess what? We get bad apples from time to time and we don't always weed them out in enough time. So you can take a case like First Lieutenant Clint Lawrence. So I'll take you to June 2012 in Afghanistan. First Lieutenant Clint Lawrence comes down from the staff to take over a platoon. Clint Lawrence was a very aggressive lieutenant who had his own ideas about how the war in Afghanistan should be being fought. Those ideas were not in a line with the rules of engagement. And that's the fundamental fact that starts us off the trail here and off the rails. Lawrence gives his soldiers guidance that is not in accordance with the ROE. Motorcycles are allowed to be engaged on site. That's the guidance given. Not a lawful order, but his soldiers don't necessarily know that because a change to the ROE would logically come through the chain of command. What the soldiers did know was their rules. If they don't witness a hostile act or hostile intent, then it's not a lawful target. And so when Lawrence tells a soldier to go ahead and engage a motorcycle, that soldier does. Fortunately, he misses. But when he tells another soldier in a turret with a turret mounted weapon to engage the same motorcycle, that soldier's more successful and kills two of the three riders on that motorcycle. And then the cover up begins. Lawrence tells the soldiers what not to report back to headquarters. Lawrence lies about where the sound of gunfire came from. But a young soldier is the one who immediately goes back to the company commander and reports this. And within a pretty quick turn, First Lieutenant Lawrence is convicted of murder and sentenced to 20 years. And so we won't always get it right at an individual actor level, but I submit to you, your army will get it right. The joint force will get it right. Strict requirements about reporting, protocols that are followed because a force is trained to understand and articulate what those requirements are makes us a much better army than we were. And that's always the hope that each and every day we learn from what we do. And we may make a mistake once, 
but we should learn from it and not make it a second time. I think back to when I was a brand new second lieutenant and it was July of 93 and I'm sitting in Mogadishu, Somalia and the two-star commander of US Forces Somalia brought all the, all the lieutenants together. Things were starting to heat up in Somalia and uh, he had concerns. So he had been a company commander in Vietnam at the time of this and then he moved up to the staff on the AmeriCal division. And he sat the lieutenants down with 25 years of scar tissue and he talked to us for quite a while about the law of armed conflict and about rules of engagement and about watching out for your soldiers and about things that happen in combat. 25 years later, I sit here today in front of you having had the experience of multiple combat zones around the world, different roles in each, whether it was platoon leader or whether, whether it was senior legal advisor uh, at the Joint Special Operations Command. Really the full spectrum of combat operations and interaction at those levels. And what I can submit to you today is the fears that General Montgomery shared with us 25 years ago are not the fears I have today. Yes, I worry about the human nature and the human element in all this, but I am confident that your Army and your joint force does a more than adequate task of educating, training, and where at all possible preventing another massacre. Thank you. Okay, we'll have some uh, now for questions. Um, I would like to just remark very carefully, as I was listening to General Berger here speaking, uh, we often talk, teach a Vietnam elective at uh, the Commanding General Staff College, and I often tell the students, most of whom believe me, but some don't, that the most dangerous thing in the world is a 19-year-old American with an M16 <laughs> or an M4. And that what keeps the, to mix a metaphor or two here, what keeps the rods in the reactor is leadership, moral, ethical leadership, as the general points out. And that is the focus of every time we talk about something like My Lai or Lawrence or anything else. It pervades everything we do in the schoolhouse. Um, I, I, was, I remember when, when reading about this, one of the soldiers said, well, why did you follow an illegal order, an unlawful order? And he said at the platoon, there ain't no unlawful orders. Are you crazy? I wouldn't tell my lieutenant I'm not going to do that. So that puts the premium then on the junior leaders in that unit to keep those rods in the reactor, particularly in situations uh, 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 like in Quang Nai province on this particular day in 1968. Um, as I look at the questions here, I will ask uh, Fred if you would elaborate a little bit on Fred Thompson and what his role cost him in terms of his, re his reaction within the division once he went back and made his reports. Uh, okay, well, um Hugh Thompson, you're talking about the helicopter pilot, warrant officer Hugh Thompson. Uh, as I said when I made my remark, remarks a couple of minutes ago, uh, Thompson was up in an observation helicopter with two crewmen. He saw what was going on on the ground. He was so upset, he went down, landed the helicopter between some fleeing Vietnamese and some pursuing soldiers and stopped at least that particular event. Uh, he went back and he informed his uh, squadron commander, uh, Major Watke, what he had heard. Uh, Watke said later he thought Thompson was over-dramatizing the event. Uh, and Hugh Thompson reported this to a number of people, including the chaplains that Professor uh, Solis talked about, went to the chaplain, uh, Creswell, I think was his name, mm -hmm. and said, uh, I, I can't believe this happened. And, and Creswell said, don't worry, uh, Mr. Thompson, I'll take care of it. I'll make sure it's reported. Um, so really, in the end, no one paid any attention to Thompson, and in fact, he became sort of a black sheep. Uh, this guy's not loyal. He's, he's making waves. Uh, and although he later got a commission as a, as a first lieutenant, uh, for many years, Thompson was ignored, and it wasn't until 1995 that, because of some efforts by historians who knew about Thompson, that the, the Army finally came through uh, with a soldier's medal for him, which is the highest award for non-combat heroism 
that a soldier can receive. So I think the truth about Thompson is, is that for many years, ignored, considered to be uh, yeah. not the hero that he was, and it's not until 1995 that he's recognized. He wrote a book about his experiences, or rather uh, an author by the name of Trent Agers wrote a book. He's here. Mr. Agers is here? He's here. Okay. All right, he wrote a book about it, uh, and certainly he's here and you can talk to him. Uh, but I think Thompson, in the end, was recognized for his heroism. Uh, sadly, he's, he's dead. He died of cancer, I think, 10 years ago now. Uh, and his uh, co-pilot, or his crew chief, is also dead. Uh, but I think Thompson is one of the heroes, and he was finally recognized for his heroism. Uh, thank you, Eric. I'm mesmerized by machinery, I guess. Uh, during the course of commitment of U.S. forces, and this is for Gary, uh, commitment of U.S. forces in Vietnam, were there records of other atrocities committed in Vietnam? Oh, very much so, all the time. Uh, the Marine Corps uh, had numerous trials. 26 Marines were convicted of war crime charges in Vietnam. Uh, there were a, a number in the Army, of course, probably more. But there was no requirement that war crime charges be uh, reported to a central command. So we can never know how many war crimes were actually committed. So when a reporter calls Fred or myself and asks, how many war crimes do we have in Vietnam? It's hard for us to explain that you know, we don't know. There's no way to determine that. But at, there, were, there were other war crimes. The Marine Corps had San Thang, uh, where 24 Civilians were murdered uh, at point blank range, all women and children, no males, well, no adult males among them. Uh, but we don't know how many. But we, what we do know is that there were prosecutions throughout the war. When we learned about these things, we took action. It didn't work so well in My Lai, but My Lai was really a one off in many respects. And yes, there were other war crimes, they were prosecuted throughout the war. And if I could add to that real quick, um, after the winter soldier, uh, protests. There was a there were and many of these soldiers again, you know, back in the United States, protesting the war, talking about the things that they had seen or heard about atrocities and war crimes. That spurred a, a, an army investigation into those claims, and there is a thick stack of of uh, summary reports in the National Archives, um, 250 approximately that describe the allegations and the results of those investigations. And I, I actually found them after Abu Ghraib. Our office uh, started to look into the treatment of detainees and POWs uh, after Abu Ghraib. And so I went to the archives and, and, and found all of these um, uh, summary files. Most of them were dropped for lack of evidence. Either people refused to testify, or they couldn't be found, or they couldn't be substantiated. Uh, but there, there was a big, uh, there in, in about 70, 71, uh, there was another big push to look at these allegations. Let me, I, I want to give you one other point here on war crimes. Yes, I think the number 350 is what I've seen, and Gary's exactly right that some were prosecuted. But at the time, the legal problem was that once you were honorably discharged from the Army or the Marine Corps, there was no longer any court-martial jurisdiction. And so in the case of Private First Class Meadlow, who admitted killing scores of Vietnamese civilians, he could not be prosecuted because he'd been honorably discharged from the Army. The only sovereign that could have prosecuted, only country that could have prosecuted Meadlow was South Vietnam. South Vietnam was not interested in prosecuting any <coughs> Americans. Remember also that in this period, if you're a guy like Meadlow and you're drafted, how long do you have to serve? Two years, right? So by the time you get through basic and advanced individual training and you go to Vietnam, boom, you're out almost as soon as you come back. So in the case of My Lai, because it was covered up for a year, many of the soldiers who killed were gone, were civilians and couldn't be prosecuted. Okay, this nature of this question really comes from two different people. And essentially it is, 
and this is addressed to the panel at large, what were the political pressures that impacted the lawyers in putting these cases together and trying them? I've talked, to, I wrote a history of the Marine Corps lawyers in Vietnam. So I've talked to virtually all of the living lawyers uh, about their cases in Vietnam. I know of zero, zero instances of political pressure on the prosecution of any case in Vietnam or in the United States. I know of no instance, instances of political pressure. I would be surprised to learn of any substantiated case. Okay. Any other response on the panel? Uh, I, I agree with that, at least uh, as a legal historian. But let me go back to the Cali case again. A public opinion after Cali was unbelievably opposed to the case. Only 9% of the American public supported the conviction in the Cali case. 9%. Which is why President Nixon interfered. And when asked whether or not Cali was a scapegoat, 83% of Americans said yes. So I agree with Gary, there isn't any political pressure, but on the other hand, Politicians do pay attention to public opinion polls. This, this isn't, I don't think, quite qualifies as political pressure in the sense the question was, was asked, but still it's, it's related uh, in terms of the South Vietnamese, right? What was their, the, their government, what was their stake, what was their position about this? Because one would think they would be deeply concerned about, you know, the killing of up to 500 civilians. Well, the fact is, that was not true. Uh, the local district chief and the province chief, both after these allegations came out, uh, conducted what they said was an investigation and basically said, look, there's just VC in that area. Uh, and if you have allegations of a massacre, that's VC propaganda. So, I mean, they just kind of wrote the whole thing off. I mean, you have to understand in, in, in this checkerboard you know, sort of war situation, a, a place like Eastern Son Tin District, as the, the name on operational maps, the, 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 the sort of uh, term they use, Pinkville, right, because it was a red area, uh, had not been under government control forever. So the government didn't feel any particular obligation to the civilians who lived there. And in fact, a number, I have this letter, um, a number of South Vietnamese senators wrote to Nixon in December of 69 and said, please, Mr. President, do not pay attention to these allegations. They're all, it's all fake news. They didn't use that term, but that's, that was the, that's what they're basically saying. It's VC propaganda, and this is simply uh, 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 going to undermine American support for South Vietnam at a critical moment. Oh, and what about the Way Massacre, right? South Vietnamese were very, you know, upset as you'd imagine of the 3,000 civilians the Viet Cong and NVA had killed after Way. And in fact, it had been in 69 that a lot of those bodies had been uncovered. So it was very much in their conscience just that, look, you just can't trust the VC. So in a sense, there was political pressure from the South Vietnamese just to move on. Uh, this question, uh, was the My Lai complex in a free fire zone? And it goes on and, and uh, basically ends up with the, asking the larger question, is there a problem with corporate culture and loose ROE? Uh, and you could further define that as command, command climate, um, mm -hmm. the, the search for the body count. And I'll address that to the entire panel as well, whoever would just to, wish to come on, comment. Yeah. So Fred and I have had this conversation uh, a couple times. Uh, and the uh, unique thing was, was there were free fire zones then. Um, they were pretty normal. And uh, they played in a role in this case. Uh, the reality is you would, I won't say never see that again. But uh, I can't imagine the circumstances where I, as a legal advisor, outside of a peer-on-peer -peer competitor fight, where I would look at a commander and say, that's even remotely a good idea. Um, and I don't think I'd find a commander who thought that was a good idea, to be honest with you. Um, and so what I submit to you 
is at the time there may have been a cultural problem with it, um, but I don't think that's the same challenge today. Fred? For those of you who study military history, you know there are various types of strategy. We like a maneuver strategy, for example. We talk about counterinsurgency. Westmoreland at this time is pursuing an attrition strategy. And if you know your military history, you know the idea behind attrition is the enemy will give, give up if we just kill so many of him that he finally doesn't have any people left and he gives up. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with an attrition strategy. We used it in World War II. But what is your metric then for measuring success in an attrition strategy? It's a body count. And so I believe, as a military historian, that a contributing factor is the attrition strategy and the idea that success on the battlefield or success in a military operation is measured by how many bodies you have. Presumably, these are all the enemy. But the problem in Vietnam is that unless you're fighting the North Vietnamese, no one's wearing a uniform. So how do I really know if this is the enemy? And I'm not saying that it necessarily meant you're inflating body counts, although that certainly happened. But I think a contributing problem here is this emphasis on body count as a reason for success. And so after My Lai, for example, uh, it's trumpeted as a big success because uh, so many of the enemy uh, have been killed. We never would today look at body count as a metric. In fact, General Berger, I think, uh, would agree that commanders today would be appalled if you suggested that body count was a metric for success. Agreed. And uh, if I could just add a couple things to that. Uh, for example, I found the America, uh, well, the 11th Infantry Brigade newsletter for this period that has a news feature on the Milai operation. And it talks about how they came in and killed 182 Viet Cong soldiers and captured three weapons. <laughs> Okay, so they, were they sharing the three? I mean, uh, it's a similar problem, you know, with Speedy Express in the Delta with General Ewell, uh, killing a whole lot of folks, not finding a whole lot of weapons. Uh, now, I argue in my book uh, that uh, West Maryland actually had a more nuanced approach to the war. Not, it wasn't just attrition. It was not just body count, but also things like weapons and chew hoys and rice and all the other things that go into war. And I'll tell you, one of the things that always struck me as bizarre about this operation is if indeed Medina and Callie and the rest you know, told their men before the operation the idea was to go in there and burn down the houses and kill the livestock, right there you would have went, ah, uh, wait a minute. That was not normal. Okay, there were operations where, like the Ben Souk operation there in Triangle, you would go in there, cordon the place off with South Vietnamese forces, separate out the potential bad guys, evacuate the civilians to another safer location, and then you would burn down the houses and not kill the livestock. You would take the livestock away and give them to the people who own them or give them to someone who could use them. I mean, rice. You, you only burned or destroyed rice if you couldn't haul it out. I mean, these are resources. So to go into a, an active village without any plan of resettling them and just say, oh, we're going to burn down the houses and kill livestock, that it was not normal. That, that, that just wasn't. Um, another point, too, about the operation, apparently this was done verbally wasn't written down. There was no operational plan. There were no fragos. There. It was just, hey, we're going to do this and that and the other thing. So when they planned the artillery preparation, because they often would, would use artillery to, 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 uh, as a shield, right, to kind of drive the enemy a certain direction. Well, the artillery bombardment was right on the western edge of the village. They never went to the South Vietnamese district chief for permission. 
I mean, there are free fire zones in Vietnam, but not when there's an actual village that does not count. It does not count. So uh, again, right there off the bat, someone should have been thinking, wait, this is not smelling right. Yeah, well, I think you're right, Eric, but I think you have to have the inclination to smell before you do anything. Uh, because the first thing that should have happened was it's 128, 182 weapons, and, or, or three weapons and 128 to 182 bodies. Mm -hmm. That should speak volumes to anybody who really cared about that. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question here, and the lawyers can hold forth. 79 hours in deliberation, why? I can remember, I have a friend in the audience here, Paul Michael Check and I were second lieutenants. I don't think they should have spent five minutes deliberating on Kelly. So why 79 hours? Do you have, have any theories? Sure, there were a number of imponderables, and that is how many did he kill? How many shall we find him guilty of killing? Uh, did, he, did he do it at all? How, and also, uh, before I was a lawyer, I was a juror, and I mean, we said, we gotta stay in here for a while. This is a big case, so we better stay in a long time. Have you got another cigarette? <laughs> there was, a lot of that went on. So there's no telling why they, in my estimation, there's no telling why they took that long. You never know what the dynamic is in a jury. Uh, it, it, you know, every jury is unique, so who knows? But these were six combat experienced officers. Five had been in Vietnam, one had, had seen combat in uh, World War II. And it's really hard to say why they might have taken that long, but uh, I'll bet we would be very surprised to get into a sky. Hey, did you see that on TV last night? And that might have taken a couple hours. But, you know, they, they realized that the eyes of the nation were on them, all of the reporters that were in the room, and they realized that this is not something we can make a snap judgment on. One of, one of the other things to remember is that uh, there's no forensic evidence. Uh, there's no CSIS yeah. coming in yeah. with a forensic pathologist who says, I examined these bodies and I could prove this is how the person was killed. There are no bodies. They are gone because it was covered up for a year. Every piece of evidence you might expect to see on television is gone. So all you have is witnesses who are saying, well, I saw Callie do this, and I saw Callie do that, and shot this person, and shot this person. But I think Gary's exactly right. That he was charged with killing 109, but the panel came back and found him guilty of killing 22. So I think you're exactly right. All of whom are unidentified. There are no names. Uh, and so I think that uh, it took a while to sort through which witness really got it right, uh, who can we really trust. And then I agree with you, uh, hey, we're not just going to come back in five minutes. We've got to make it look as if we're serious about this. I'm not suggesting that it was easy, because I think someone must have said, well, are we really going to find him guilty of premeditated murder? Uh, how about manslaughter? Could we go with manslaughter? or negligent homicide. I, I mean, so I'm sure there was discussion about that. A word about military juries. If I was, con if I was charged with a serious crime, I'd rather be charged by a, tried by a military court any day. And that's because your jurors are, unless there's enlisted, uh, 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 requested by the accused, your jurors are college trained individuals, officers who are trained to obey orders. When they get the instructions for the judge, I want you to consider this, you shall not consider this elephant, Military juries do it, and I think military juries, for example, I watched the, the uh, O.J. Simpson trial, and I remember the lady who was placed on the jury uh, late in the game, and she was asked if she read the newspaper. She said, yes, what do you read? The, the daily racing form. That's the kind of jury that it was sitting for O.J. Simpson. You don't get that in the military. You get excellent jurors in the military. Okay, next question here. Uh, how important was Seymour Hersh's reporting on me live for the bringing to light of the massacre, and were other journalists important? You want to answer that? <laughs> Charges had been preferred. Notice how I passed that ball down the line uh, here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There actually is a, a reporter in the Montgomery, uh, Alabama newspaper who broke the me live story the day before Hirsch did. Uh, and they only found out about it because somebody called him in Montgomery and said, 
they preferred charges at Fort Benning against this lieutenant by the name of Callie. Uh, Hirsch, who became quite famous, won a Pulitzer, uh, still writes for the New Yorker, he broke the story the next day. Hirsch is really famous because he got the interview with Paul Meadlow. And it was Meadlow's interview in which Meadlow admitted to murdering all the villagers at My Lai that really broke the story open. And then Hirsch was very smart. He pursued the story. He followed what Piers was doing. He wrote a number of books about the uh, massacre. Cover Up was one of them. And yes, I think you can't underestimate Seymour Hirsch's power in making sure that the story uh, stayed alive. Uh, I should just say I, I talked to Seymour Hirsch last week because I invited him to come. And uh, he basically said, I, you know, I, I don't go to Mili things, which I kind of understand. It might become a bit of a circus uh, if, he, if, if he did. But uh, I'm looking forward to having a nice long chat with him. He has an office downtown here. And so uh, I sent him a copy of my book and I uh, said, yeah, let's, let's have some tea. So I, I hope to have a bit of a conversation. But um, yeah, he. Uh, he just, he, he impressed on me, uh, I said, you know, what, what could I say on your behalf? And I think the thing that, that really stood out for him is, as, as some of the comments um, were earlier, there was some really, really dark stuff that happened at Mili that, that not everyone knows about. You know, the sexual offenses, for example, really, you know, bone chilling, um, they even now aren't widely known. And he said, look, if you ever, you know, go through and read all six volumes with all the testimony, uh, it, it'll, yeah, it'll make your hair stand on end. So uh, there's, a, there's a really great summary report of the Peers Inquiry, about 400 pages long, that uh, we're going to be posting on the website. Um, but there's a lot more. If you really want to get down into it and read the testimony, there's a lot there. Okay, this sort of speaks to the earlier topic of leadership. The question is, did Kelly lead his platoon into My Lai, or did, they or did he lose control of his platoon, and they were essentially leading him at that point? And it's addressed to uh, Colonel Birch. Birch, excuse me. Well, that, I don't think was Kelly leading his platoon. Yes, he, he was. Uh, the platoon entered the village, and it's Callie who's the trigger, who's the metamorphosis that uh, stops the guarding of these civilians and begins their killing. Uh, there were some soldiers in the platoon who refused to follow Callie's orders to execute the villagers, to kill them, but most did. Uh, so Yes, Cali was leading. He was recognized as uh, the man in charge, uh, and that's why My Lai happened. If, if Cali had said, we're not doing anything other than safeguarding these civilians and we'll take them and move them to another location, I don't believe uh, we'd be sitting here today. It would have never happened. Um, let me go and, and make one more comment about the trials. After the second enlisted soldier was acquitted at trial, and the defense was, I was following orders, the Army pretty much concluded that with the drafty Army as it then existed, it was very unlikely to get a conviction of a junior enlisted soldier who raised the defense of superior orders. Uh, and that's probably true, I think. Uh, maybe the cases should have been tried anyway, but as Professor Solis correctly says, the Army really didn't have the stomach uh, to follow through with these prosecutions. Mr. Shugart, can you raise your hand, please? Uh, Mr. Shugart writes that he supported General Pierce's investigation logistically in 1970, and he asked the question, what happened to General Pierce? I don't know either. Yeah. I know he never made four stars. 
Well, there, there are many who believe that it cost him a fourth star. Uh, he was a phenomenal uh, leader. Uh, Westmoreland, uh, peers believe that Westmoreland chose him to lead the inquiry precisely because he was not a West Point graduate. Westmoreland didn't necessarily think that a West Point grad wouldn't do a good job, but he was afraid that there might be some criticism uh, that West Pointers might protect their own. Of course, this is a myth. It would never happen. Uh, but having said that, uh, Pier that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> Piers, uh, Piers is a UCLA ROTC product. Uh, and uh, phenomenal career, as, as Professor Solis says. Uh, he'd been in Burma, decorated with the Silver Star uh, at least twice. And I, I think that Piers was so hard-hitting and so critical and so uh, right in what he did uh, that he, like Hugh Thompson, is another one of the real heroes here. Did it cost him a fourth star? There's no way to know. But there's some people who believe that it did cost him his fourth star. Uh, just, again, another you know, uh, comment to emphasize what I think is the really amazing quality of the Pierce inquiry. It, it is an absolute first-rate, unsparing, investigative effort. Uh, they went to extraordinary lengths to get it right, to get the facts, and to call things out. Um, and it's, and even if you just read the 400 page summary, uh, you, you will be, I think, really amazed. In the photos that I had running before the presentation, those all came from the peer summary report. The fact that they were able to pinpoint through all of the interviews the precise movements of each squad and platoon through My Lai 4 and get a timeline that made sense uh, shows you the, 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 the extent to which they went to get the facts. The My Lai inquiry available on Amazon used. Every time I see one that says like new, I buy it. I've got three or four. And the trial. The Court Martial of Lieutenant Callie by Hammer. If you have these two books, you've got most, most of me like. Okay, th this is for General Berger. How has the Melee Massacre uh, and Legacy set the standard for non military paid security forces, and when they act outside the law, should they be tried under civilian or UCMJ law? <laughs> As Fred Bork is whispering in my ear, an easy question. Uh, thank you. Um, Wow, 3.30. Uh, I think we're nearly out of time, <laughs> sir. XO, I need a phone call. Um, not, an, uh, not an easy question, difficult problem. Right, it goes back to the comment about the only sovereign who could have tried many of the soldiers who had left would have been the South Vietnamese had there been an interest. And so we often find ourselves as we craft our status forces agreements or letters of agreement or whatever document we go into a country with, wrestling through many of those issues. And those are issues judge advocates wrestle through with their commanders um, and with their counterparts and whatever that host nation may be, assuming that our presence is permissive. Um, it's a vastly different uh, set of circumstances when it's a, a non-permissive environment. Um, but when we're there under some sort of agreement with uh, the host nation, then that's something we try to work out ahead of time. Is it going to be first crack? Does that go to the host nation in terms of the right to prosecute? Or does it fall on us? Under the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, under MEJA, we can try those folks. Um, sometimes easier said than done. We can bring them back. And there have been trials in the federal court system back here in the US as well. So there are venues. There are multiple venues, as a matter of fact. So there's, there's three different courses of action right there, all of which can be pursued. Uh, but there are a fair amount of challenges. Some of it, quite frankly, often gets, gets caught up in contractual issues. Uh, were they within the scope of their duties? Um, generally not, but, but that can also of, often be raised as a defense. And so you'll see many of these cases linger, um, both as civil litigation, as criminal litigation, and again, in any of the different venues. 
a tough thing, something we try to wrestle with ahead of time so that uh, we're not reacting to contact, but rather have a plan in place. Um, but it doesn't always work out perfectly. I think General Berger would agree that today's prosecution, prosecutorial system in the military isn't the Milai system. Milai changed everything. It was Milai that generated the attention in the military for the law of armed conflict to be taught in an effective way. And today, we don't have the problems of jurisdiction that we had in 1971, 1972. So we see, we see trials of uh, individuals who, I, I remember the one in Riverside, where there were three Marines who had uh, shot two prisoners, and uh, they had gotten out of the Marine Corps, two had stayed in the reserves, and uh, one was a sergeant in the Riverside Police Department. They charged him with the murders in, in, uh, in, in uh, thank you, Afghanistan. So today, it's not the problem that it used to be. And the, mil the military is very effective, in my opinion, today in seeing that uh, criminality is prosecuted uh, to the full extent that it should be. OK, these like, next two are connected, and they're for General Berger, and you might really want a phone call after these. <laughs> Uh, the first question, given ongoing problems in the armed forces of sexual assault in Abu Ghraib, why should we believe the problem is solved? The second question that sort of amplifies that, perhaps, what threat do you think there may be an overtraining in commanders and soldiers and then them becoming complacent? All right, let me take a, I'll take the second one first. We'll start with overtraining and complacency. I have yet to meet a well-trained soldier who felt that one, he or she was too well-trained or that the multiple repetitions led to anything other than a greater, de of, greater degree of precision and perfection. We get better at doing things by doing them. That is the simple reality. And when we need to be able to do things instinctively under adverse conditions, we need them to happen based on how we've trained. And so I would submit to the questioner that uh, that simply doesn't happen. Um, I think in the, in the individual where that would happen, you've got the wrong person who's, who's not a good soldier. Um, I think that's just the simple reality there, and I think there would be enough other indicators that they weren't a good soldier that they'd be short for, for our army. Um, as to the question on sexual assault, and do I think uh, with, with the, the scope of the problem as alleged, do I think that um, our prosecution has, is fixed, our prosecution, our, our system is fixed. Um, I would tell you, I think we do a very good job. We take all of those cases that civilian authorities won't take. We take the cases where alcohol is involved that a civilian prosecutor wouldn't touch. We take, the case, we take the hard cases. Do we win every case? We absolutely don't. But we take the cases in an effort to try to achieve justice for victims. Um, and without sounding like a series of talking points or without sounding glib, the, the simple reality is, is there is a demonstrated body of data that shows that we try the hard cases. And you're not going to win the hard cases. If you've got somebody who as a prosecutor says, first rate prosecutor, I've never lost a case. The simple adage is you've never tried a hard case. <laughs> and so we're not going to win them all. Uh, there are a number of things uh, that point positively to where we've gone. Our special victim counsel program, our ability to provide counsel to the accused, not the government prosecutor, not the defense counsel, but individual counsel to the accused to help them through the process has been extremely powerful, <laughs> extremely well appreciated by, by our victims, um, and has added a third party with standing before the bar, incredibly unique in our justice system here in the United States, um, but all the services do it, and that's been a powerful multiplier. I think we have made significant strides. We often see the data will say, well, you've got increased reporting. Well, increased reporting means more people feel comfortable. So whether you want to take the very popular hashtag lingo of me too, right? That's increased reporting. That's victims who feel comfortable, who feel the system will be responsive to their allegations, who feel that they will get their day in court. And whether that's a day actually in court or whether that is simply the services they need to recover and somewhere in between, I think we do a great job with that. We're not perfect, again. We're an organization of human beings. 
uh, but we try to only make a mistake once and learn from it. And we should recognize the extreme difficulty in proving some of these sexual offenses without fresh complaint. Uh, as a prosecutor, I dreaded 20 years ago, but it's, the problem is so much worse now when you have a victim who comes forward and says six months ago. Six months ago is, a, is, is an extremely hard case to prove. You have no physical evidence. You have no uh, contemporaneous evidence that you can see. All you have is, as they say, he said and she said. That's a, that's a really a damn hard case to prove. And the military takes them on all the time. Thank you. I've been told by our minders here we have one time for one more question. And this one's a bit rhetorical and philosophical, uh, which is probably presented to the wrong guy here as an old infantry guy. But the question is, where are these American soldiers now? Does it serve public interest for them to share their stories publicly to bring healing and or closure to the events of My Lai? And I'll address the, the entire panel here. Okay. <laughs> According to the source of all knowledge, which is either Wikipedia or Google, uh, Rusty Cowley is still alive. He was born in 1942, so he's 75, 76. He lives in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, he has never apologized or admitted responsibility he still says he was following orders. He did at a Kiwanis Club luncheon, I think at Kiwanis Club, might have been Rotary, some years ago, said he was sort of sorry for what had happened at My Lai. I think that's about it. Um, Ron Reidenauer is dead. He died of a heart attack in his 50s while playing uh, handball. Very sad. Uh, Hugh Thompson has passed away as have the two uh, crewmen who were with him on the helicopter. They're also both dead. Uh, Samuel Coster died five or six years ago. Uh, Ernest Medina, I believe, is still alive. Uh, Paul Meadlow is still alive, and that's a very interesting story. Meadlow, the one who admitted to killing all the villagers at My Lai, the following day, Meadlow stepped on a land uh, Meadlow stepped on a landmine and it blew his foot off. And he insists that that was God's punishment for what he had done at Meadlow the day before. Uh, he's still alive. He lives in Indiana. Uh, the last time I checked, many of these people, because it's been more than 50 years ago, have passed from the scene. So certainly, I think it probably would be a good idea if they wanted to talk, but that's not really up to this panel. I would just simply add that, you know, as a learning organization, right, with or without those soldiers present, we know their stories. We know most of the facts. We won't know why it took 79 hours in the deliberation room. Um, we won't know why they did some of the things they did, but we've got enough to learn the lessons, and I think that's the more critical piece. Yeah. Yes, there is a there is a fascination that would uh, would follow from having their physical presence here and their participation, but I don't think it's at all necessary for us to move forward. And if I could just make a, a few observations about my experiences overseas, uh, I went to Afghanistan, Kandahar Province, in March 2010, the Five Two Striker Brigade. Some of you may recall, uh, there was a kill team that uh, was, was operating at the time. Um, sergeant was sort of the ringleader, and uh, basically uh, some, some, some thrill kills that uh, came to light mm, a couple months or two after I came home. It was uh, ironic because uh, when I first came to, to Ramrod, the 2-1 headquarters, I walk in the S2X shop. And they said, oh, you know, hi, I'm Dr. Valores, I'm from military history. And the one guy said, oh, you're here for the other guy. Literally, you know, oh, no, no. OK, so at the time, I had, what are you talking about? Well, they were investigating these, um, these killings at the time. And it, and it came out later. But I'll tell you uh, what really impressed me, you know, the commander and everyone else, is, is, is how seriously, I didn't, again, didn't know about the investigation, but how seriously they took 
any allegation. I, I remember one of the uh, Afghan uh, uh, contractors apparently had gotten shoved by an American soldier, and the battalion commander just read the riot act. You know, you do not do that. And, I mean, he was serious. Um, and then the second uh, vignette was when I went to um, Camp Arif John in September, September, October 2010, uh, 2014, when the ISIL situation was beginning to heat up over there. And General Terry, the three-star, who was running, essentially running the war from Camp Arifjan in Kuwait, uh, he, the last person he would look at before he gave an order, literally, there were times where we were looking at a satellite feed of an individual ISIL soldier somewhere out in Iraq, and General Terry was going to give the order for a Predator drone to drop a bomb or an F-18 or whatever. Last person he looked at was the JAG. And if JAG said no, it wasn't going to happen. I mean, it, it, at every level, they were, uh, you know, mining their P's and Q's, and it was very impressive. So I think that, again, whatever the individuals that may be still with us from me lie, I think uh, we have learned the lessons in, in many ways. And I think uh, let's not forget. This sort of brings us then to the end of our session. I'd like to thank the panel and my learned colleagues here for sharing their experiences and knowledge. I'd also like to thank all of you who came out today. This was an ugly day in the history of the U.S. Army and the United States of America, but it is one that we should never forget to make sure that it never happens again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.